Hello! Merry Christmas! Happy Holidays! Let's talk about a book! I love Charles Dickens a lot. I've loved every book of his that I have read, and there's a very special place in my heart for A Christmas Carol, which I didn't read until I was an adult. My husband and I now have a tradition of reading it out loud to each other every year. Most years we finish it, sometimes we don't. Uh, this year we pulled it off, and uh, I have decades now of um, thoughts about this book that I just kind of wanted to share. I grew up on The Muppet Christmas Carol, which is delightful and wonderful, and um, I have seen uh, some of the other adaptations. The Mickey one is cute. I really like the Jack Palance one, <laughs> which is very obscure, but look it up, it's real. Um, haven't seen most of the more recent ones. Oh, Mr. Magoo! That's the other one. Anyway, <laughs> this isn't about that. This is um, mostly about the book, but I bring up the adaptations because there are some really incredible, delightful things that are in the book that are not in the adaptations. And um, it's very easy to say, oh, just go read it, everybody. But, um, you know, we all have limited time on this earth. Why not tell you some of the things? Uh, so I'm just going to talk about some of the cool stuff that's in the book. Um, a lot of it, almost everything I would say has been in one adaptation or another. Uh, but you, you got to change things, of course. Uh, visual medium versus literary medium and all that, it's going to be different. So there may be things in here that, that you haven't heard before, and uh, I think that it's pretty great. All of this is going to assume that you've seen at least one adaptation or have a basic familiarity with the plot. You could probably pick a lot of it up from context as I go along, but I'm, I'm rambling because uh, I'm, I, I, can't, I can't write a script right now. I'll, I'll talk about myself at the end of the video, I guess. Um, so let's talk about this. The number one thing that I want to say about this book is that it is not a book about having the Christmas spirit per se. Um, you may have heard that uh, Merry Christmas or Christmas being like the biggest holiday, biggest deal of the year really wasn't um, the culture, the uh, English-speaking Christian culture. This book is like what made Christmas. <laughs> this is where it started. So it's a little bit like the argument of, um, you know, Lord of the Rings. It's the foundation of the genre, but like it was, it was building on things that were not exactly like it <laughs> and creating a whole new, a whole new direction um, for the genre to go. So this is very much like that in terms of Christmas stories. This is the original. Uh, and I like to keep that in mind because it, uh, it, it really sheds some light on the fact that some of the things that are, that are being said and written in this book are totally new. Um, when we watch adaptations of it now, we are very used to uh, a bajillion holiday movies every year. Uh, we're getting Santa claus and Polar Expressed and uh, Grinched, and everybody needs to have that good old Christmas spirit. This is not coming into that tradition. This is saying you need to be a good person, full stop, and Christmas might as well inspire you. <laughs> in fact, the, the in-universe reason for why this is happening at this time of year is because it's the seventh anniversary of Jacob Marley's death. Uh, that is, appears to be the only reason. Now, there are thematic reasons why it's a very good time for it to be set. I think it's stated really well by the, uh, the two portly gentlemen that come to Ebenezer and ask him for donations for the poor when they say, we choose this time because it is a time of all others when want is keenly felt and abundance rejoices. Of course, it's set in, uh, in London, which is in a pretty cold part of the world, and it is written as a particularly bitingly cold, frigid, awful time. So if you want to make the comparison between the rich people in their big, beautiful, warm houses having feasts and keeping Christmas as the Lord Mayor's kitchen ought to do, versus the poor people shivering in, uh, you know, the garrets. This is, this is the time. Parties versus destitution. And yet, at the same time, bringing in this, this spirit of love that people, in whatever walk of life they may be, can be either happy or miserable. You can be rich and happy, like Mr. Fezziwig, or you could be rich and miserable, like Scrooge. You can be poor and happy, like the Cratchits. Or you could be poor and miserable, uh, like the people who are selling Scrooge's things in uh, 
the fourth section of the book, which I'll get to. <laughs> the thing about Scrooge is that he is a jerk. He is careless and incurious, which is the worst insult that I know how to give. Incurious about the lives of the people around him. When the famous line is given to him, um, of course there are prisons and poor houses, but you know, some cannot go there and some would rather die. He says, if they'd rather die, they better do it. Um, a line that often doesn't get picked up is that right after that, decrease the surplus population, he says, besides, I don't know that. Um, in other words, I have no evidence that what you're telling me is true, that they can't or that they don't want to. And the gentleman responds, but you might know it. And Scrooge says, it's none of my business. My business occupies me constantly. I love it so much. <laughs> Maybe one of these years I'll just read the whole thing because it's public domain and I can just go, uh, uh, like a stream or something. Maybe next year. What was I going to say? Oh yeah, this year I've been studying a lot of stuff about, um, like 19th century eugenics uh, kind of stuff, and that would have been around in uh, Scrooge's mentality, right? People talking about the surplus population. It was okay to talk like that at the time. It's rather horrifying to us now to say it out loud, but uh, people were very regularly saying we need to strengthen the, the all of humanity and uh, you have to break a few eggs to make an omelet kind of stuff. So this is, uh, to some extent, Charles Dickens standing up against that, which is pretty cool. So as I said, Scrooge is not a good person. He doesn't care about other people. Because of that, any good thing that he gets presented with makes him angry. One of the first contrasts that we see is with his nephew Fred, who is made better by Christmas. And uh, to my point earlier about how, like, it's thematically cool that this is set in wintertime and that it's about the birth of Christ and things like that, any holiday would have made Fred a better person, because Fred was looking for that kind of thing. And any holiday would have made Scrooge a worse person. He's very cranky. Um, he's very impressed with himself. Uh, he has a good opinion of himself, it says. He's, he's basically, he's just flat out demonic. It makes him angry when the people around him are having a good time. And a lot of the adaptations take the route of trying to explain why he's like this. Um, they delve back and they add sad things to his past or misdeeds to his past that uh, are like this. He, he reacts the way he does because he's in pain. And I think it's so important that that is not the reason why uh, Scrooge is the way he is. And as I go through the book with you here, I want to make that case. Scrooge is not the way he is because he has suffered or because he got involved in, mixed up in bad things as a kid. That's easier to stomach when you're watching it on a screen, but it's not how it works in real life. Scrooge is getting close to the end of his, let's say, agency. Um, we know he'll die soon-ish, but uh, we don't know exactly when. And it seems like he is at an extreme point. His partner, Jacob, is for some reason given permission to come back to him. And this is interesting because there is a, there is a parable of Jesus in the New Testament where he describes um, a person trying to come back from the dead to warn somebody else and uh, that person is told you, you can't do that if they don't believe all of the prophets that have ever lived they're not gonna believe you either what the spirits do is not appear to Scrooge and say hey just so you know there's a hell and it is very real and you will go there um, that's not the point when Marley visits he tells him, It is required of every man that the spirit within him should walk abroad among his fellow men and travel far and wide 
And if that spirit goes not forth in life, it is condemned to do so after death. In life, my spirit never roved beyond the narrow limits of our money-changing hole, and weary journeys lie before me. This is the first indication of what Scrooge has to do to become a changed man. The structure of the Christmas Carol goes like this. There's an introduction, there's a conclusion, and then there's three uh, lessons that Scrooge needs to learn. None of those lessons are, you suck, and none of those lessons are, Christmas spirit. And none of those lessons are bad things happen to you and that's why you are the way you are. One of my favorite classes that I took in university was entirely about the Divine Comedy. So Dante's Inferno, but also Dante's Purgatorio and Dante's Paradiso, which is a medieval Italian book about allegorically traveling through hell, traveling through purgatory, and traveling through heaven. And all of the political opponents you meet on the way. In the second part of that book, The Purgatorio, Dante describes people who can go to heaven but who have some, some sins that they need to work off first. And the way that he describes each of the levels of the mountain of purgatory is when you enter, you see examples of people who possessed the virtue that you're trying to achieve. One of them is always Mary, and then um, there's a secular one, uh, if I recall correctly. So, step one, you see a good example. Step two, you do the labor of working off your sin. So, because it's, it's Dante, uh, that usually involves some form of, of uh, torture and, uh, and work, and um, they're quite brutal. <laughs> good example, do some work, and then on your way out, after you have been purged, the last thing that happens is they scare you <laughs> and show you an example of somebody who died still in the, in the grasp of the sin that you just burned off. I, I contend that these are the same three steps that Scrooge is going to go through. They call it the, the bridle, the penance, and the whip. So the bridle pulls you into where you're supposed to be, and the whip says, mm, you better not, you better not go back to it. Another way to put it um, could be that there is one central lesson that Scrooge needs to learn, which is that you have to go abroad among your fellow men. And in order to learn that lesson, he has to be in the mood first. And then he needs a serious reality check afterwards. <laughs> so let's talk about stave two. For each of the spirits, the character design is really carefully thought out, and uh, they mess around with it a lot from adaptation to adaptation, but there are some little details that just about never show up that I want to point out, because they're really symbolic and carefully chosen. The first spirit is the spirit of Christmas past, specifically Scrooge's past, and it's described as sort of like a child, sort of like an old man, sort of like both. It has arms and legs that are appearing and disappearing. Uh, it's hazy much like the past. You can't quite grab it, but it has very strong arms and hands because it can grab you. <laughs> it uh, is wearing a, 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 a robe or a garment that has bright summery flowers on it, which I have never seen in any of the adaptations. And on its head, it is wearing a, um, a candle extinguisher. I guess it's not on its head, it's, uh, it's under its arm. So it's carried around this, this hat, and Scrooge immediately was like, Put that on. Scrooge does not want to think about his past. He doesn't want to remember his childhood. He doesn't want to remember his young adulthood. It's not something that he ever thinks about. The spirit tells Scrooge uh, that he is looking f after his welfare and his reclamation, making it very clear we're, we are here to not only change you, but change you back. Contrary to popular adaptation, Scrooge did not have the worst childhood. There certainly are sad elements to his life. He was lonely. It is strongly implied that his father was uh, a violent drunk at one point. He seems to have gotten over that at the only moment in time that we're shown, but who knows if that stuck around. All of his friends get to, to go home and uh, party. He has a very sweet little sister that he loves a lot. Uh, who, of course, is eventually going to be the mother of Freddy. But when Scrooge arrives at the school, the change, the effect on him, is instant. He walks around saying, I know this place. I know that kid. I know that kid. He starts dancing. Nothing has happened in this story yet. From 
go, he immediately feels emotional. <laughs> and when they go into the schoolroom and they see where he, in his child self, is sitting alone and reading, he does feel sad for his past self, and the effect of that sadness is he thinks about the little boy that came to his door earlier that day singing a hymn, and he thinks to himself, I wish I had given that kid something. Remember, nothing has happened. They haven't, they haven't done anything to him. All they had to do was show him somebody he cared about, which, because he's kind of a bad person, is only himself. And the, the spark of caring about somebody is enough, even a little bit, to make him want to think about somebody else's well-being. It's amazing. He has a lot of pleasant memories associated with his childhood, and it's interesting, the most pleasant ones are from reading books. There's a whole section that doesn't really get adapted um, very frequently, where he gets so excited about the book that he sees his child self reading, um, he sees Alibaba come out of the pages and run by, and he sees Robinson Crusoe, and he sees the parrot, and uh, he laughs about it, and he's like, I remember that! Yeah, they did come and visit me, just like this! This is exactly how it was! They came and they, and they were here! And even though he had a lonely childhood, he had a happy childhood because he had good books. It's just, it's really interesting. There's a, there's a mix of, of elements in there that's a bit more nuanced than you usually see. The next memory that the spirit shows him is when he was an apprentice in his, uh, financial field at old Fezziwig's house having a, having a Christmas party. And um, a particular thing that I want to pull out from the, from the Muppet version is that it has him come up to Fozziwig, as it is, and say, do you realize how much the firm is spending on this party? Um, at, like, he's already starting to get greedy and, like, become scroogey. And it's not that way in the book. In fact, um, the party is extravagant and wonderful, and Scrooge loves it. And he has a fellow apprentice who loves it. And after the party is cleaned up, the two of them sit around talking and laughing about what a great time it was. And the spirit asks Scrooge about it and says, you know, this isn't actually that amazing, relatively speaking. This is a nice party, but it's not enormous. And um, Scrooge gets super into it and, and tells, this is, you know, our present day and walking around in his bathrobe, Scrooge, um, tells the spirit that, no, my boss had the power to make my life miserable or to make my life wonderful. And he made it wonderful. <laughs> and it was just through these little ways of, of, of treating us kindly and being generous with us and respecting us. He had this incredible power and he used it in this way. It's a really, really big deal. And then he stops and he thinks about Bob Cratchit and he wishes that he had done something for Bob Cratchit. Again, just seeing any little example of kindness makes him feel like he wants to do that too. It is extremely contagious. <laughs> and it's, it's important here too. He didn't grow up being anti-Christmas. Like I said, we kind of put that in into modern adaptations because we think of Christmas spirit as being this thing, but it wasn't a thing back then. Um, like, it was normal to like it because it was a good time, but there was no, you know, the kind of weird pressure to have a Merry Christmas or else that we kind of experience in modern times. None of that, none of that is, is in the book until he's an adult and he doesn't want to have a Merry anything. Just particularly Christmas is bugging him today but he's, he's grumpy all the time. Um, it says that he, uh, he iced his office in the dog days and didn't thaw it one degree in the winter. The next uh, scene that gets shown to us is his fiance releasing him from their agreement to get married. And the change happened between the last vignette and this vignette. At the party, he was very happy and he appreciated his employer, and now that he has begun in his field, he has become avaricious. It's starting. And as that is starting, he is losing the love that he has for other people, kind of proportionally. Not because he is trying to have comfort, 
uh, which would be, you know, what is money for, but because he is trying to have money, full stop. Uh, the, the kind of attitude that Scrooge has when we meet him in this book is that he lives in dark, dingy rooms that are very cold, and um, he doesn't make merry himself and he doesn't make merry others. He just has money and keeps it, and um, it doesn't do anybody any good, including himself. He works hard and he doesn't enjoy any of it, <laughs> but um, he enjoys this, this power. His fiance leaves him, because she can tell that he is not in love with her anymore, and she tells him so. And in the book, he doesn't argue with her. Having a spouse is part of the normal pattern for most people, but she asks him, if we were just meeting now for the first time, like, would you go, would you go for it? And he's like, well, no. <laughs> you got me there. Scrooge is mad about this, but it doesn't break his heart particularly the way that it does in the beautiful, beautiful Michael Caine uh, performance, which should be exactly the way it is. <laughs> I am merely saying <laughs> that it is not that way in the book. So here's the scene that's frequently left out. After that vision, there is one more, and it is set right around the time that Jacob Marley is dying. Scrooge sees Belle as a mother all these years later, and she has an adult daughter. She has a husband, there are tons of other kids in the family, it is a happy household, and the ghost forces Scrooge to see um, this woman's life went on. And it's not looking at her that fills him with kind of pain, it's looking at the daughter and imagining if he had had that daughter himself. But even there, he is able to be calm and just watch. So why is this shown to him? This is supposed to be his past, right? The reason is, when Belle's husband comes in and is greeted happily by everybody, he says, I saw an old friend of yours today. And she says, who was it? He says, guess. And she says, I don't know. Scrooge. And he says, yeah, it was him. He didn't seem that happy, but he's working hard. And that is what makes Ebenezer lose it. And he says, I freaking can't take this anymore. Shut up. Stop showing me things. I think that's really telling. The thing he can't handle is somebody that he wronged still having benevolent feelings towards him. He is hurt and offended and confused by that to the point where he physically attacks the ghost. He grabs the extinguisher out of its arms and he shoves it down over its head and presses it into the ground. But... As hard as he presses the past and tries to cover it, the light continues to spill out and he can't actually stop it. Very poetic uh, sequence until finally it leaves him and he, uh, he conks out and gets ready for the next night. Another thing um, that's interesting, I suppose I should talk about this later, but I might forget, is uh, he can't handle being pitied right now. <laughs> Give him two chapters and he will be begging to be pitied. Uh, it'll be the thing that he needs. <laughs> and wants more than anything else because of the big change that is going to happen in uh, part three. Now, when I say the big change, you'll notice I have mentioned several times that he already had this, this spark of being a generous person who gave a care about other people, and that uh, was eaten away not because bad things happened to him, because bad things happen to everybody, um, but because he decided he cared more about trying to get and get and get and get. And uh, he stopped paying attention to other people. Uh, it wore off. So, I discussed at the beginning that uh, the second part is about doing the, doing the penance, doing the work. So that's what the Ghost of Christmas Present is going to do. So again, let's talk about the uh, costume, the character design. The Ghost of Christmas Present is like a big Father Christmas kind of a figure. That often um, does get represented, I think, more, more frequently than like the flower-dressed old man, kid, many arms, many legs. <laughs> kind of a thing I was describing before. Um, but he's like a giant, but he can like squeeze down into any room, but you can still tell he's a giant. They do that effect really well in the, in the Disney, by the way. I think it's neat that they made a whole separate um, Muppet character for this guy instead of casting like Sweetums or something. <laughs> which would have been the other option, I guess, or Big Bird. Um, 
I think they did it. They did it right. But my favorite detail of the Ghost of Christmas present is a scabbard hanging at his belt. Uh, and there's no sword in it, and the scabbard is eaten up with rust. Christmas is is so peaceful that it wears a rusty, nasty, broken old scabbard just to say, look, I don't have a weapon. <laughs> I specifically don't have a weapon. Not because I didn't bring one, but because I won't bring one. He also is sitting in a throne made of food. There's just delicious things everywhere. It's heaped up. Symbolic of the fact that the present is the time when all the good stuff is. This is, this is the one of the three time periods where you can actually feast on what you've got. So the ghost of Christmas present takes him out into the world. Uh, like Jacob Marley said, this is Scrooge's present. This is what Scrooge could be doing this Christmas. I won't go into tons and tons of detail about everything here, but I will note um, he spends a lot of time traveling among people. It's not just the Cratchits. He gets to go out to sea and visit sailors. He gets to go into mines. He gets to go into poor houses out in the ruralist... <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> out in the far out uh, into the country parts of, of England. Scrooge and the ghost visit so many different families and households that Scrooge is pretty sure that many, many days are passing <laughs> and that it's not all contained in one day. This is part of why he's so surprised at the end that it is still Christmas, because not only has he been through three nights worth of crazy dreams, he's been through a very long time of visiting many, many people. The ghost has a cornucopia that is also a torch that is also a salt shaker. <laughs> And, um, he sprinkles, I guess, water. So it's more like a vinegar. What do you sprinkle? Anyway, it's magic. And, um, he travels around and he, and he shakes his, uh, special, special spice onto everybody's holiday uh, meals. And the flavor is his own. He says it will improve any meal that is kindly given and a poor one most. And Scrooge asks why a poor one most, and he says because it needs it most. It's not about what you deserve, it's about what you need. It's part of what, uh, what Scrooge is gonna learn here. I did sort of skip over the Cratchits, and that's because those are always pretty well represented in all of the adaptations. So if you're familiar with it at all, you're familiar with Bob, you're familiar with Tiny Tim. A lot of detail is gone into about the Cratchits in the book, of course. And it's beautiful. The writing is gorgeous. The family is very sweet. There are dynamics between the different siblings. It's just tremendous. I love it so much. And my favorite thing in the entire book happens here. There's a famous moment where Scrooge learns just how ill Tiny Tim is and that he is very likely to die within the next year. There is a possibility that it will change and there's a possibility that it won't. Scrooge is upset by this. He already has come to care about Tiny Tim. He's having a great time observing this family party. Uh, they are so pleased with each other and pleased with everything that they have even though it's it's not much. He is distraught to hear that Tiny Tim is going to die. Now, famously, the ghost says to him, well, if he's going to die, then he better do it and decrease the surplus population. After that, he keeps talking in the book, and I will read you what he says. Man, said the ghost, if man you be in heart, not adamant, forbear that wicked cant until you have discovered what the surplus is and where it is. Will you decide what men shall live, what men shall die? It may be that in the sight of heaven you are more worthless and less fit to live than millions like this poor man's child. Oh God, to hear the insect on the leaf pronouncing on the too much life among his hungry brothers in the dust. Scrooge is rightly <laughs> ashamed of himself to hear this amazing paragraph spoken to him. Um, and it is at that moment that the Cratchit family toasts him as a... Uh, as the employer and wishes him a long and happy life. And it makes them kind of sad to do so. It's a bummer to bring him up, but they are generous people. After traveling around with the spirit for a while, Scrooge is returned to his uh, own town and to his nephew's party, the same party that Freddy had invited him to and gets to watch them. And again, it goes into lots of detail. Who's at the party? Uh, there's a guy there that's really flirting hard with one of the female attendees. It's very amusing. She's into it. It's all good. Um, 
there are all the games and the fun. It is as strongly as possible implied that Freddy's wife is actually pregnant. It just says that she's sitting in the corner with a footstool because it was considered like sex talk uh, at, at this time uh, to mention when people were pregnant. So that's a thing. That's a cool little detail about um, Fred and, and I think uh, Clara is her name, Fred and Clara's life. They do play games and Scrooge gets so into it. Once again, he is very involved in what he's seeing. He is partying with them. He's guessing at all the guessing games. And um, this, is, this is one place where I do have a little bit of beef with the, uh, with the Muppet one. Because they do the thing where they say, okay, I'm thinking of an animal. It's like a mean animal. It's not that cute. It's not in the zoo. And, and they laugh about it. And of course the answer is, it's your Uncle Scrooge. And they chuckle and laugh. This does not hurt Scrooge's feelings in the book. <laughs> he thinks that that is very, very funny. And I love that. I like that he is getting to a point here where he's like, yep, yeah, that's me, all right. There's an extra detail where they say, oh, Freddy, you, you, uh, you threw us off. We asked you if it was a bear and you said no. So it's a great little scene, very cute. I want to reiterate here, it's really important that like F Fred and his wife are great people. <laughs> they are very kind. Fred talks about how he is happy to visit Scrooge. He thinks it's funny that he said Christmas is a humbug. He has this very jolly laugh and he says, I am going to go there every year and invite him to this party. And he can keep being rude to me and it's cool because he's family and I feel bad for him and it's just very sweet. I keep mentioning about uh, the, the you have to travel among your fellow men thing. Fred understands that in the opening. He has this great quote where when he is describing why he personally likes Christmas time so much, he says, during this time, people are more likely to think of people below them as if they really were fellow passengers to the grave and not another race of creatures bound on other journeys. He gets it. The last thing that happens in this section Honestly, I would love to see people's comments about it because it's the one part of the book where I, I feel like I kind of don't get it yet. There's this very weird moment um, that appears in some adaptations and not others where the spirit of Christmas present is preparing to leave and he reveals hiding inside his robe these two awful uh, shriveled children. And one of them is called ignorance and one of them is called want. Beware them both. Most of all, beware the boy, ignorance. For in his brow I see that written which is doom, unless the writing be erased. And um, he turns to the, the city and is like, yeah, you know it's true. You can deny it as much as you want, but uh, you're gonna see what happens to you. I think it certainly ties into the theme that I'm talking about, that ignorance in the sense of, of not knowing about the people around you, what I called incuriosity earlier. Um, is kind of the the root of all of this, all of this um, suffering. But yeah, ignorance and want. There's something. There's something I'm not getting. So if it seems obvious to you and you're going shrub dryad, what are you talking about? Um, let me know. Anyway, the ghost of Christmas Future just looks like the Grim Reaper. It's very straightforward. There is a reason he looks like that. It is not subtle. It is explicitly pointed out in, later on when they're talking about death stuff. Scrooge is like, oh, I just realized why this guy is a big black robed monster. This section of the book is funny. Uh, it's one of those things where the twist is very, very obvious, <laughs> um, but Scrooge doesn't get it. And I go back and forth between whether I think that Charles Dickens knows that the reader knows what's happening and is, is winking at them about how, how silly Scrooge is, or if, if he's trying to surprise you with it. Uh, you know, maybe a little bit of both. We know that he, he used to perform this story himself uh, as a one-man play at Christmas parties, so probably like the adults saw what was coming and the kids didn't sort of thing. In any case, uh, the Ghost of Christmas Future is here to show him very murky shadows of things that might be. And as I mentioned, Scrooge at this point has, has done the work of traveling abroad among his fellow men with the Ghost of Christmas Present, and he feels very inspired. He saw families loving each other. He saw that there's a place for him in his family. 
he has started to really care about some of these things that are happening. He has been reminded that he used to enjoy this stuff, that he used to be a child, um, all of that. And so at the beginning of part four, as far as Scrooge knows, he's good to go. He has already decided he's going to start trying to change his life. But it's not over yet, because the thing that he has not done yet is face the consequences of what he has done to other people. And the best way to show that is to show him, here's a world where you have committed these actions, and you stop committing those actions. It's not the same as It's a Wonderful Life where oh, you never existed at all. It's, look what happens when the only variable that changes in the world is that you are no longer doing what you have been wont to do. And it is harrowing. First of all, that his business people that he has always tried to remain in good standing with, just in a business sense, crack jokes about his funeral, and um, they greet each other by saying, hey, old Scratch got his, huh? Yeah, I guess so. It's cold today, isn't it? And that's, that's as much as they care. Old Scratch meaning Satan, <laughs> by the way. Um, so no, no friends, nobody cares about uh, his funeral. He doesn't supposedly realize that it's his funeral at this time. He's looking around for himself in this crowd, doesn't see himself. Uh, he figures, I guess I succeeded in changing my life and I'm not here. Good on me. I'm excited to see what I'm doing in this future. The next place they go is into one of the poor parts of town. It's not the same poor part of town where the Cratchits live. It's much worse. The people are not living in families. Um, they don't even have doors. They are selling scrap iron and refuse and fat for some reason. And there's theft and ignorance and want, really. It makes a point of saying that Scrooge has never been to this part of town before. He knows where they are in town and he knows that he has never gone that, that way. He has not walked among his fellow men in this part of town. And um, he, he sees them uh, trading his belongings there. And uh, it's just another form of the kind of greed that he himself has and the kind of um, disdain for human life, but it is, it is up close and personal in a way that he's usually able to avoid because he's wealthy and he doesn't have to get into the nitty gritty, dirty, literally taking the shirts off of dead guys to sell them kind of stuff. These people have the same attitude about human life that he does, but they are right up in it, whereas he can kind of pretend that he's above it. Um, so he's being forced to, to look at that happens to be the case that the stuff that they're selling is his stuff and it is as freaky to him as if he was watching them sell body parts between devils. And uh, he keeps asking the spirit like, who is this poor schmuck that everybody is talking about? And the spirit at this point actually shows him the body. He's very curious to know, but the spirit can't speak. And so it just points at the dead body laying there with the sheet over its head, like, pick it up. Pick it up. You're gonna have to pick it up. I see it. And Scrooge is like, I get what you're trying to say, spirit, but I literally can't. I'm sorry. I cannot do this. He also has this very uh, profound experience in the room with this dead body, where it's as if a voice is speaking in his head, uh, saying that when somebody is loved, death has no power to make their body frightening. To make it less beautiful. And that would be almost impossible to include in an adaptation because it just happens inside his own head. After this, Scrooge says, look, this is starting to freak me out a lot. Surely somebody had some reaction to this guy dying. Uh, and again, a scene that gets left out a lot, but that I think is really cool and important. A poor family that we haven't seen before at this point in the book find out that Scrooge has died, and they say, Oh, thank God. Oh, I'm sorry. And that was, a, that was a terrible thing to say. And the reason why they have that reaction is that they are one of the families who owe Scrooge money, and they are going to be out in the cold uh, any minute now. But he just happened to die that night, and it... it is a new life for them. They are now going to be able to 
scrape the money together before whoever inherits the business comes around and uh, that's that's the only kind of reaction that the spirit is able to show him and Scrooge is like <laughs> people people usually have tenderer feelings than that about death right so the spirit takes him to go see Tiny Tim and when Scrooge visits the Cratchit house and um, sees them them grieving the loss of Tiny Tim. It is so soon after Tim's death that his body is still in the house uh, in an upstairs room. And it is a really powerful contrast between this and the experience that he just had in the chamber with the sheet over it. Um, Bob goes up there to sit next to his little son's body and, um, you know, have a cry and kiss his little face and he loves him. And, uh, this body is not scary. There is nothing death can do to make one feature odious. Um, and, uh, Bob is reconciled to what has happened. He needs to get his feelings out, but when he goes downstairs to be with his family again, he's happy. And uh, they're talking about the other kids' futures, and he tells them he's he's very, very happy, and he's really proud of all of them. It's incredible. And of course, uh, the final piece of the story is that Ebenezer is is shown his own grave and um, told, "This is this is your death. I'm showing you the Christmas that is related to you. All of the Christmas things that will happen in the future that are about you." And um, he's distraught, of course. What would, what would be the point of showing me all this if I couldn't change it? And uh, the ghost can't answer him. It's a little shaken, apparently. And it doesn't make him any promises. He is not told, you can change this. He just hopes he can. He has seen what the future will be like for the people around him if he doesn't repent if he doesn't change. It's not so much about himself. He doesn't look around and go, oh, I'm gonna die if I don't change. He looks around and goes, people are suffering because of me. I skipped over my other favorite part of the story, which was way at the beginning, and this is a great time to go back to it. After Jacob Marley first comes to Scrooge, as he is leaving out the window, Scrooge looks out into the street and he sees a whole host of other spirits, like Jacob Marley. Every one of them wore chains, like Marley's ghost. Some few, they might be guilty governments, were linked together. None were free. Many had been personally known to Scrooge in their lives. He had been quite familiar with one old ghost in a white waistcoat with a monstrous iron safe attached to its ankle, who cried piteously at being unable to assist a wretched woman with an infant whom it saw below upon a doorstep. The misery with all of them was clearly that they sought to interfere for good in human matters and had lost the power forever. Scrooge is not threatened with torture. He is threatened with not being able to help other people anymore. And when he wakes up in the morning and discovers that his whole life is in front of him, that it is Christmas, meaning that he didn't sleep through all this time. He is overjoyed and thrilled because he has the opportunity to go among his fellow men and he knows what the stakes are. He remembers that he used to care about this and he knows exactly what it is that he has to do. He has been through these three specific lessons. You care about this, here is how to fix it. Here is what will happen if you don't. It's just wonderful. The final uh, stave is very short, but it goes through him making many actual changes, actions. It goes through him uh, providing this big dinner for his employee and a pay raise and talking to him about how to take care of his family, as a result of which Tiny Tim doesn't die. Like, that's a... There's a funny thing, and I keep bringing up the Muppet thing, but there's the thing where he says, and Tiny Tim, who did not die, that's in the book, like it's in capital letters, he did not die. 
the point of the book is not that you should throw everything away, it's that you should use your resources to take care of each other. When that happens, this child doesn't die. It's awesome. Presumably the family that was happy that Scrooge was gone, he will be able to help them out too by being a less terrible creditor. He'll be able to be generous to them. He, he goes and seeks out uh, the people who were seeking donations and gives all of his back payments uh, to them. And it fills him with joy that he has the chance to do that. He didn't lose the chance to take care of everybody. Jacob Marley's suffering is... I'm gonna go back and read a quote. Captive, bound, and double-ironed not to know the ages of incessant labor by immortal creatures, for this earth must pass into eternity before the good of which it is susceptible is all developed. Not to know that any Christian spirit working kindly in its little sphere, whatever it may be, will find its mortal life too short for its vast means of usefulness. This book is about how incredibly powerful we are, and how much capacity we have to affect each other's lives. The thing that saves Scrooge from being a damned soul damned like a river, stopped from being useful, is not developing the spirit of Christmas, um, or believing in Santa, or seeing ghosts. <laughs> seeing ghosts doesn't save you. What saves him is reflecting on himself and his past, learning about the people around him, and making amends for the consequences of his actions. Those are the three things that can change a person. It happens symbolically with ghosts in this book, but it can happen less symbolically for real. Learn about yourself, learn about the people around you, and make up for the things that you've done and change. Um, so of course I do highly recommend reading it, but uh, if you don't get around to it this year, I hope this gives you um, some, of the, some of the little goosebumps and, and the wonderful inspiration that it gives to me. We, uh, we can do stuff materially in the world to make each other's lives better. We, we have the power. It's wonderful. So, um, Merry Christmas. Uh, whether, whether you are of that denomination or not, be merry on this day. And, um, for the rest of these holidays, take care of each other. Let me know in the comments, uh, if you have your own thoughts about the Christmas Carol. I would love to. I would love to chat with people about it. Um, what What's your second favorite adaptation of it after the Muppet one? <laughs>